as well as give students an opportunity to interact with the eminent industry personalities. The Fomento lecture series was started in the year 2018 and as a part of this series we have had the privilege to interact with many eminent speakers from various industries. The last two webinars uh, we had the privilege to interact with Mr. Praful Chanchar and Mr. Ajit Ranade. And today it is our honor and privilege to hear Mr. San Sanjit Hegde Desai uh, for the third webinar based Fomento lecture series. Now, without any further ado, I would like to request our Dean, Professor V. V. Kamar, to give the welcome address. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes I hear loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah. So on behalf of Goa Business School, uh, let me welcome you all for uh, today's webinar uh, by Mr. Sanjit uh, Hegde Desai. He's talking on when mountains speak uh, lessons from magnificent journey to the roof of Africa. This is the just now just uh, Teja mentioned that this is the third lecture under Fomento series that we are organizing in the web webinar format since the pandemic struck. Uh, Sanjit works for Google as a program manager for their devices and services product area. I initially thought uh, that this will be a technical talk. Interestingly, he will be talking about his journey in life using mountain tracking as a metaphor. This morning, I had a brief chat with him in Konkani. I told him that in agile software development, we often use rock climbing sport as a metaphor. The agile team needs to consist of individuals with talent. They need to be trained continuously on tools and techniques. They should be able to revise their plans quickly, keep the documentation to minimum so that their progress is not hampered. There is a lot to learn from agile philosophy, even in life. Uh, maybe uh, Sanjit will give a technical talk sometime in future. Uh, Sanjit is a son of the soil, a proud alumni of Agnel Polytechnic and Goa College of Engineering. He started his long and arduous career journey way back in 1995, and he is currently working with Google at their Mountain View office in California, the most sought after job and the workplace. Sanjit, we look forward to hearing from you about your journey and lessons learned. I would like to take this opportunity to also announce that from this academic year, we at Goa Business School are starting a new five year integrated interdisciplinary MSc program with specialization in computer science, data science, decision science, and economics. This is the first time Goa University will be launching a liberal science program with an exit option after three years with BSc in data science. With those brief remarks, I hand over the floor to our student uh, Vaibhavi Pai to introduce the speaker. Thank you all for attending the webinar and my best wishes to all of you to face the challenging time ahead. Stay home, stay safe, and try and innovate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. I, Vaibhavi Pai, student of Goa Business School's MBA program, would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guest speaker for today's Fomento lecture series, Mr. Sanjeet Hegde Desai. He would be talking on the topic, When the Mountains Speak, his experiences, on the magnificent journey to Mount Kilimanjaro, which is Africa's highest point. Mr. Sanjit Hegde Desai is an experienced supply chain and information systems professional. He works as a program manager at Google for their devices and services product area. As a program manager, he has successfully led several cross-functional, multi-quarter information system execution programs, often spanning geographically distributed teams. Additionally, he also serves as a chief of staff for his organization of around 100 plus people. In his free time, he enjoys listening to all kinds of music, make some of his own, and sing. He likes to travel whenever possible. He tries to stay fit, 
to tracking, hiking, and yoga. So I welcome you once again. I request you to kindly address the gathering. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, if I could just get a nod from either Nilesh or Professor Kamath or Teja, anyone else? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you clearly, Nilesh. All right. I'm going to first uh, start by sharing the presentation that I have and then uh, get. Are you able to see uh, what do you see? Do you just see the, uh, the the meet window or do you see the presentation? No, presentation is yet to see. We are yet okay. to see the presentation. Yeah, the meet window is seen. How about now? Uh, yes. Are you able to see it now? Yes, we are able okay. to see the presentation. I'm going to put it in the present mode and then we'll go from there. OK, is this good? I hope you can see the slide in the present mode. Yes. OK, thank you. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be speaking with you all. Um, I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe uh, and healthy in these trying times. <clears throat> so as you could see from the title, I'm going to actually speak about something very close to my heart. Right? Uh, it's an incredible hike that I and some of my friends took, uh, did climbing the Kilimanjaro, essentially a couple of years ago. Now, I don't want to bother you with a travelogue. Uh, you could read a plenty of them on internet, watch a number of videos on YouTube or documentaries on Netflix. Instead, like Professor Kamath said, I'm going to use this journey as a metaphor to share with you some of the lessons I learned or rather refreshed along the way. Those I thought you'd be useful to you as you navigate your own career um, as you graduate out of the Goa Business School. But let me begin by sharing an interesting trait of a cousin of mine. I grew up in a joint family surrounded by cousins and their personalities essentially shaped mine as well. So as young boys, we all loved to play cricket. And this particular cousin of mine would step out to bat in a game. He was an opener actually, mind you. He would loudly proclaim, Are aaz mus zero, aaz disna jiva. Now to those who don't understand Gokhani, that means, oh, I think I'll end up uh, scoring a duck today. So it was his style to free himself of any expectations. Now, this way, if he did score even a single run, he technically outperformed the expectations. And if he didn't, eh, like that's the way you would talk. So later on, I realized that he was so far ahead of his times. So for instance, even Apple, a company that leads all public companies with a staggering $1.3 trillion market cap, calls this strategy, strategy under promise and over deliver. Now, why do I tell you this? Like, well, like Professor Borde mentioned, I'm a program manager at Google, one amongst the many thousands spread across the world at Google and other companies. I run project, I execute, uh, and software projects of that. So I'm not a visionary, I'm not a strategist, certainly not an accomplished leader in Nestle's scholars that you're used to hearing from. I am also not someone who's used to speaking in front of large crowds um, and, and certainly not in front of curious students. So if you sense some sort of anxiety, trust me, it is real. Um, but it was actually Professor Borde who put himself in shoes of our fearless leaders and laid my fears to rest by saying, na." So this is, this happened quite a few times. I have to actually tell you this, right? So I, I initially when he reached out to me and I was a little hesitant about, you know, giving this talk, like I said, because uh, Teja and, and you know, the other lady who basically spoke, spoke about so many eminent people having come here and actually, you know, given you, given you guys a talk. And I was thinking that, oh my God, is this going to be very embarrassing? But um, he said, don't worry, just speak. And then I accepted it. And later on, he started sending me all these flyers with the people who have written books and research papers and all that stuff. And towards the end, he would say, Bina ka, bhiupa ji garaz na. So same way. So I had to, you know, be be very, very, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I rest, I guess, set your expectations properly. But then I thought, what's the worst could happen, right? You might as well go back home, or in this case, actually now log off with a feeling of having attended a TED, TED talk. But I do hope really sincerely that this words of experience from what I would say an average student who is from a very small hamlet in Kepe, who was lucky enough to have navigated his way to like the foremost innovation hub in the United States and be working for the most um, you know innovative company in the world almost. Uh, hopefully those words to certain to some extent would be helpful to you as you, like I said, 
you know, get out of the school and navigate your career. So while we are there at disclaimers, I would like to throw another one out there. Uh, while I work for Google, I'm not representing Google. So I'm here in my personal capacity. So I'm not speaking in any official capacity. So any opinions, if, if, if reflect from my talk, therefore are solely mine, right? Um, I'll only say that I've had the privilege of working for Google for the last seven years. I'm very grateful for it. Um, I'll be happy to, of course, answer any questions on my experience with Google or for that matter, any other companies that I've worked for in US or studying in US to the best of my ability. I started as a full technician at a local Goan firm. I tried my hand at sales. I became a programmer, then a functional analyst, and now I'm a program manager. A person, they say, changes careers seven times on an average in their lifetime. I think I'm getting there. Now, one thing I absolutely love uh, is music. I like to sing a little bit. Um, I would like to travel way more than I do, like I was introduced. I try to keep myself fit. I read history and other nonfiction topics when I'm not reading emails, that is. Now, the picture that you see on the right hand side, uh, that is actually me on the peak of Kilimanjaro. One, it's an evidence that I actually made it. And two, I was trying to strike a pose like Shah Rukh Khan. Now, I know it's a very pathetic imitation, but that's the best I could do at 19,000 feet when I could barely keep my feet steady, let alone lift my hands up after six days of walking. So Kilimanjaro, right? For those who don't know what that is, here's a little introduction. Um, it's the tallest mountain in Africa. Uh, its peak named Uhuru, which you see right there, is at 5,895 meters or 19,341 19, feet above the sea level. It's the highest freestanding mountain in the world. That is, it is all by itself, unlike say Himalaya, which is really a range of mountains. It is about 100 kilometers long, 60 kilometers wide. So it's pretty wide as well. It's one of the seven summits in the world. So one amongst the seven highest mountains, <clears throat> seven highest mountains in each of the continents. So for example, you have Everest or Himalaya in, in Asian continent. You have Akankagua in the, in the uh, South American continent. And similarly, you have Kilimanjaro in Africa. And there are others in the different parts of the world as well, or different continents of the world. Um, am I presenting still? Uh, I think there was a slight confusion, uh, Sanjit. I think you'll have to start representing again. Okay. Yeah. There was a participant who by mistake presented his screen. Yeah. Okay. Let me try. Probably one of the problems with online. Uh... Oh, no worries. Yes. It's coming up. Is this good? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Cool. Now, there are three volcanic cones, including one called Kibo, that could erupt again. Um, it's a dormant volcano, and uh, that could erupt at any time. In fact, as you can tell, uh, it didn't erupt while we were there. Otherwise, I wouldn't be speaking with you. But um, Kibo is outer, you know, is on the outer edge of a massive volcanic crater, which is usually covered with snow, and really makes a wonderful sight at the top. Uh, so if you decide to go, please do. Um, just a little bit more, Lemosho route is a route we took to get to the peak. Now, this trail is considered to be the most scenic of the routes to the Uhuru peak. Someone said it's like traveling from Amazon to Antarctica due to multiple climactic zones along the way. So you get tropical forest, two different kinds of grasslands. There is an alpine desert. So essentially it's cold, but it's a desert where nothing grows out there. And then there is a snow capped peak. Now, generally, the climbing success rate at Kilimanjaro varies from 50 to 85 percent. Uh, so which means, well, it depends on which route you take. You could you could be traveling from five day route to or, a, or a, take a five day route or an eight day route. Now, Lemosho route has the highest success rate of 85 percent. What that means is 15 percent of the people who attempt to climb will never make it largely due to altitude sickness. Because over 10,000 feet, the oxygen levels begin dropping rapidly. And at 19,000 feet, they are half of that at what, what they are at the sea level. So which makes it extremely hard to breathe and therefore to walk. So for that matter, to do anything. Uh, I mean, I guess that explains my Shah Rukh Khan pose also. But as you can see, the total distance is about 70 kilometers. And it took us six days to go up and two days to descend. And then there were seven nights of camping under really, really starry skies, like skies I've never seen in my life ever before. Coincidentally, we reached uh, the summit on the 8th of July. So we are just past the two year anniversary. 
So this talk is really a nice way to commemorate uh, the adventure for me. Now for the business students in the audience, this is the only chart that I'm going to show you today. So you can breathe easy a little bit. All right, so now we get to the lessons. Um, so lesson one, passion. Uh, they say no one really knows the story of tomorrow's dawn. And, and this is an African proverb, by the way. So I struggled for some time, like I said, when um, Professor Nilesh asked me to uh, speak and he said he casually dropped the P word, the passion, right? Now it's a word that most have a very uneasy relationship with. I want to share an incident that happened on our way back that pretty much inspired the material for this talk. In the middle of the flat arid tract, right, under the scorching hot sun, our guide, Mr. Herman Mosha, whose picture you can see here, pretty dramatically announced to his exhausted guests and clients, this is my office, you know, welcome to my office. And all of a sudden, I remember that statement having changed my perspective about the hike. I started reflecting on something my mother had mentioned to me once. You know, during each of my trips, I carried some of America subconsciously back home with me, right? Be it clothing, language, accent, attitude, perspectives. For example, I remember getting health conscious all of a sudden and going for a run in Cape. You know, Cape is where I grew up and Cape is where I was born. It's a very sleepy, small, closely neat village, or at, at least so it was over a decade ago. So this friendly neighbor stops uh, on his bike. He was going for work and he stops and he, with a deep concern on his face, clearly visible, asked me, Baba, so I asked him, so for those who don't understand Konkani, it means everything is okay. Should I drop you somewhere? Because he was not used to seeing people, you know, uh, do an early morning run, I guess, at that point in time. So in a similar way, I was chatting with my mother about work-life balance, right? In a term that had just picked up steam in US and complaining about how the life in US is all about work. And she simply remarks, not in as many words, but to this extent that, you know, there is no such thing as work-life balance, right? That there is only life. Such powerful words. So as Herman spoke those words, I could see my mother standing in the kitchen, hands outstretched, besides not so scorching heat from the gas stove. This is my office. Welcome to my office, she says. Now back in the hot barren land, I remember having an epiphany about what happiness at work could mean. Hitherto, I thought that this was a privilege available only to somebody like a musician or a sportsman. And here I was facing somebody doing something I thought was very ordinary job of a guy, but had elevated it to an extraordinary level in just a fraction of a moment. Not all of us have the fortune of doing what we love to do. In fact, very tiny percentage of folks would. Some amongst the rest of us would struggle to even discover one. Therefore, it is really important, I feel, to make of what's offered to you your passion. Now, that doesn't mean that give up your dreams, of course. It only means giving best to what you're doing at the moment. And if the lady of fortune smiles at you, like it did on me, for example, might as well end up working um, for a company like Google that generously allows 20% of your time to be spent on projects of your choices. Now, it gives you the space to experiment, improve, innovate. I personally enjoyed this work, wanting to explore something that I'm passionate about, for example, education to the children. Why? One of my reports is actually working outside her work and, and, and on a cutting edge technology project. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share right now, but, but she was passionate about it and, and she's following it. Google and other companies have discovered that this approach works really well, right? There is an African proverb, by, and by the way, you'll see a lot of them today. Send the child where he wants to go to see his best space. And the most famous product, for example, has come out of such initiatives as Gmail, which we use every day. Another example is Android Wear. Lesson two, a song that has no leader goes wrong. Uh, again, another African proverb. Herman Moshe, the guide here with his crew uh, on the picture, as you can see, is a Kilimanjaro mountain guide in the city of Arusha, Tanzania. He's tall, dark, handsome. He's the dearest son in the family. They call him Baba. He speaks with a deep and steady voice in a no-nonsense manner, almost sage-like. He's made more than 160 trips to the Uhuru Peak and back. 160. He's well on his way to become a legend guide in Arusha. Herman is more than a guide. He's a born leader. Right? His goals are very clear, that of leading the hikers to the peak and bringing them back to the base safely. He's aware of his enormous responsibility and that imposes really. Right, He's aware 
that a lot of people will perish along the way. A bigger percentage will actually give up. He knows the mountains well, but more importantly, he knows the caliber of the of his hikers or clients even better. He's a role model to his team of porters who aspire to be like him. He accords them the same respect that he accords to his clients, and he has earned their respect in turn. He sings with them, but more importantly, he lets them lead the song. Now here he is giving a pep talk, like I said, to his crew. So this would typically begin on our, you know, on a hike. This would typically he would typically begin with a pep talk and then follow it up with a song. So all of them would sing together. And I have really lovely videos which I would have loved to share, but we won't have enough time today. Now people like Herman make you realize that leadership is not necessarily about stalwarts like Nelson Mandela or Lokman Nitilak or Sebastian Rabos. Leadership happens at every level, right? For me, leadership has meant many things. Right? I when I manage a team at Google, I think I'm a leader. Sure, my sphere of influence is very limited, but nonetheless, I'm responsible for shaping my team members' careers, managing the budget for my organization, managing the schedules of the projects that I run. These are all leadership responsibilities. You do not need to be a CEO or a politician to be a leader. In fact, sometimes you would wonder if they're mutually exclusive. Now, to me, the foremost trait of a leader is his integrity. Uh, Integrity is defined, you know, generally in dictionary as honesty, bearing of really high moral principles. But if you really break it down, it's really the consistency between the values, the core, the intentions, the mental, and your actions and words, the crust of you as a person. Leadership also means that you take an initiative, getting out of your comfort zone. For example, at Google, we generally execute projects in a very, very scrappy way. The mantra is, do not let the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Right. What this often translates to is that there'll be a project, but the roles and responsibilities are only hazily defined. And yet a company like Google thrives on somebody taking an initiative and doing the right thing in that context. Google has this really cool benefit of peer bonus, right? And a peer bonus is actually a very small amount that you can award to a peer, like you know, your colleague, when you think when you think you are doing a great job. Um, uh, and and it's a small amount. Nonetheless, looks like uh, somebody else is presenting again. And uh, can you confirm? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, somebody had started presenting again. I, I, I had to remove him out, but uh, I, I can see your slide. Okay. I don't know. I think so that means your presentation is still okay. on. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, like I was saying, the peer bonus is a very small amount, right? But imagine the gratification that you get being recognized by somebody within your group or within your you know, extended team. Even promotions, for example, are determined by uh, your peer feedback. And I think which is an excellent thing because leaders do really emerge and not, not, not appointed. <clears throat> that brings me to the third lesson. Um, it's the journey indeed, right? Haraka, haraka, haina, baraka. Uh, this is the only proverb I remember in Swahili, the language people in Arusha or most of Africa speak. It means, literally means Hari Hari has no blessings. Um, and, and in English, obviously, we know it as haste makes waste. Um, if there was one word you would learn if you went hiking in Africa, it would be pole, which means slow. It's a word incessantly repeated by the guys to remind you to walk slowly, very, very slowly. And the reason I guess I'm sorry, Sanjit, I'm really sorry to disturb you again. Uh, so problem is, I think because somebody presented people, your slide, your slide window has gone somewhere else, which people are not able to see. Can you okay. stop presenting and start presenting again? I, I'm, I'm really very sorry on this. No, no problem at all. I also request all the participants, please take care of your uh, instruments. Don't start say, sharing a screen because we, we have to then get back to the whole uh, process all over again. Thank you. Sorry, sir. I would also request all to turn off the videos uh, to save the bandwidth. Yeah, I'll I'll turn off mine too. <laughs> not this. No, no, no. Okay. I'm joking. joking. I'm joking. <laughs> okay. Is this? Uh, are you? Are you seeing it? Yes, I can see it. Yes, yeah, we can. We can yes, see yes, it. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, so like I was telling, the guys would repeatedly remind you to walk slowly, walk slowly, very, very slowly, pole pole. And the reason is acclimatization, right? No matter how fit you are, unless you are acclimatized, you have no idea how your body is going to react to it uh, or react to the height essentially. Because like I talked about the thin air. So if you're wondering what that picture is showing, these are stretchers that are used to carry people back to the base when people get sick or injured. Now being carried on that stretcher on a rocky trail when you're injured or sick is not an experience you would ever want in life because I've actually seen some people being carried down and they were screaming in pain simply because of the jerks that they would get on the rocky thing. Now the only reason why we didn't have to use the stretcher is because actually we walked slowly, uh, really, really slowly, gentle, relaxed, almost meditative pace. Trust me, we were the laziest group of climbers. We started like the, the you know, later than anybody, reached even later than all the other climbers. Ideally, on the last day, as an example, I'll give you, if you want to be on the peak to see the sunrise, when we reached up there, the sun was actually shining over our heads. But you know what? We laughed. We worried less about the summit. We enjoyed the breathtaking beauty around us. We even chanted Jai Matadi. I'm not joking. So much so that the local porters and some other hikers from the other group started greeting us by you know, using the chant, saying, Hey, Jai Matadi. We sang songs. Some of the, some of the groups called us the singing group right um we didn't care the guides of the porters in fact of the other groups would often wonder and ask our guides why are these people so happy on such a grueling night and and i promise you i'm not really joking or dramatizing this it was really unusual now occasionally i remind myself pole pole when i feel restless particularly as i feel grounded in my home during this covid times live through another day that feels and looks exactly the same as yesterday I tell myself pole pole when I feel agitated, annoyed when the project isn't running at the same pace that I expected it to. Now, lest be let you know, lest it be misinterpreted, pole doesn't really mean that you deliberately slow yourself down. It just means that your pace is unique to you. You're not comparing, you're not competing. This is particularly important for students attending the webinar. Um, it's easy to feel rushed, right? Particularly when you graduate with a lot of ambitions. And you have an MBA in your pocket, it's even easier to feel entitled. But any opportunity you get, uh, please do respect it. Remember to eliminate that sense of entitlement. Feel free to take risks, of course, but getting on fundamentals right. And pole pole, everything will be okay. If you want to remember, remember the song, pole pole saaj na dire dire balma. You know, that's kind of keep, keep yourself reminding yourself, and that's what I do. Now, recently I came across an interview with one of our brilliant musicians, Mr. A. R. Rahman, where he said the COVID situation has helped him in certain ways. Uh, that how one feels that this world is really run by corporations, that all of us are one but a tiny component in a giant invisible machine, and that often um, you know we run so fast that one, one feels that they've actually left their soul behind. Now, please remember as we speak, a lot of people are dying in the world because of this situation. Some are jobless, some are starving, particularly places like Arusha and being from Goa, you could imagine where the entire economy depends on the tourism. Now, we're lucky to be, you know, here talking to each other on internet, connecting with each other on the internet. Absorb that, soak that in. I would say remind yourself, pole pole, hold hands with what's really important to you and do not push yourself ahead of your soul. Now, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite proverbs. Um, someone once said about Kilimanjaro, it's always further than it looks, it's always harder than it looks, and it's always um, uh, taller than it looks. You know, it's somewhat like you see in the car uh, side view mirrors, objects are bigger than you can see them in the mirror. Somewhat of a reminder of that. Only the opposite, of course. Um, I've spoken about the journey, the guide, and the passion, but let me talk a little bit about my teammates and the porters, right? Uh, bearing one, and this is by the way on the right hand side is a picture of all six of us who actually made it. Bearing one who has run marathons, uh, the Paresh, he, the rest of us were really folks in average shape. You know, regardless, we were all apprehensive about you know the hike. Like, would we make it? Would we come back safe? But most importantly, uh, would we survive the test of friendship? Because they say your relationships are often tested when you go on a journey like this. But I'm so glad that we did. I mean, I can speak for myself. 
there was no way I would have made it to the top if not for the constant support, encouragement, coaching, pep talk, and more importantly, entertainment from my teammates. And it really, really matters in life too when your individual determination starts wavering off. Now, what do I say about the porters, right? Um, besides only that, you must have heard about this, that there are a thousand suns behind the cloud, whereas you see only one. They are the friendliest folks I ever met, despite the most arduous work that they do for a pittance. They woke up earlier than us, they slept later than us, they cooked, they served us, um, they packed everything after we started, they carried our luggage, food, even a portable toilet, and yet reached earlier than us, than us, set up our tents ahead of us reaching, they fetched water from us, they served us tea, and all with a smile all the time. I think in this team, we perhaps did the easiest job, and that of simply walking, carrying our only our bodies one step at a time. Now, this is true of any project that you would be part of, right? If not for a team that is laser focused on your goal, that is excruciatingly hardworking, and it's unlikely that you will meet your objectives. In fact, my experience tell me that one of the most important issues you will find in a democratic environment is to align everybody, right? When you hear things like, or he's a shapoter, you know, to sangler samjana. You know, listen to this sort of cues and see what could potentially go wrong, right? These are the these are the very fundamental cues that you could hear. And better you get at this, better you will be able to manage the risk, whether it's your life or the project. If you could get all the people in your team aligned, working in the same direction, trust me, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. Now, remember that sometimes you need to change, right? President Truman once said that it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And porters are a perfect example of that. Sometimes you need to make an attempt to align. Sometimes you need to be that invisible sun behind the clouds. Now that requires, however, a change in your thinking, a shift and expansion in, I would say, if I don't want to sound overly spiritual here, but expansion in your consciousness. Now look at my journey, for instance, right, in terms of change management. A change in careers has also meant change in companies. I worked for Tata, Oracle, Accenture, Google, and other small but very critical startup called Churchill Software in Bangalore. Different educational institutions like Agnell Polytechnic, Government Engineering College, University of South Florida, different geographic locations like Bangalore, Florida, California. And each has presented its own values, norms, and cultures, which has been a constant change, a change that I had to embrace sometimes maintain a very courteous relationship with, or sometimes simply survive. Now, one thing that has helped me is the ability to communicate, which is what I want to speak next. But of course, within the constraints of my passion, my leadership skills, you know, my pace, ability, manage my relation, and whatever limited capacity that is to manage relationship with my immediate and extended team. Now, if there is one picture that makes me happy, most happy, when I remember hike, remember the hike, it is this. And it is not because of that certificate I'm holding. It's really because of the smiles of the porters. Now, I climb the mountain, sure, right? But thousands have and will in the future. But I'm sure mountain doesn't really give a damn. Who gives damn are the people who really care are these porters, right? And they were so genuinely happy for me. And I still sort of share the bond with many of them. I feel convinced about it because I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I shared that bond with them. What, how else can I say? And how else do you explain the smiles on the faces of this portal who was so genuinely happy that I actually made it on top? I was able to do it with a very smattering of Swahili and some ridiculously uh, insignificant gestures for them. Some of them even today are my FP friends. Some write to me regularly on WhatsApp. If you heard of Yuval Noah Harari, he's one of the most celebrated nonfiction writers in the recent years. In an extremely well-written book called Sapiens, he notes that perhaps the most important lesson our race humans survived, reason our, our, our race survived, is language, right? An ability to communicate. I believe him, but when I go through my emails and sit through the meetings and get flooded by the news media, article, design documents, and all of that, I feel that if there is one reason why our race will disappear, it's the language too. I mean, it's it's just abused. Our, 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 I guess all of us, and, and even me perhaps, right, being part of that, 
have successive generations have abused the language in that the core intent of the communication is lost you know i often remember that joke like used to hear when i was young uh, the two deaf folks talking to each other right one guy says are koi re badran sollo so the other guy doesn't want to like obviously he wants to pretend that he can hear koi re badran sollo and are best to badran hota lo and the third you know the guy says oh okay okay man this will to badran hota kya man so the communication has become that that um how i don't even have the right word for it but so superfluous so much so that i began to believe and and if this is not enough in fact i was thinking that um, if this 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 is not enough you know people also use sometimes uh, two languages to say the exact same things so for example you know there is there is an auntie who lives uh, around me who will who will basically say ma karet samjhana kit jalte hain and then she'll also say the same thing again in english i really don't understand anything just to make that impact right um there was another actor on the tv the other day he was saying about all this nepotism talk that is going on in india this actor was saying are hum koi altu faltu actor hai kya now at least stop there no but he had to say oh do you think we are now what right there is no word for altu faltu so he got stuck there right so get into this you know inconsequential sort of communication try and avoid this you know one of my cousins who's an advocate now that i remember he he um, i hope he's in the audience too so he can hear that he made a very good point about he's an advocate so he speaks when he speaks he wants to get paid for it because he speaks of something of value um uh, and i i think everybody should be conscious about that i think leave the the payment part of it but i think what what i took out of it is value what you're saying when you're communicating to people i mean of course in informal environment it doesn't matter so much but when you actually go out and speak in meetings and do your presentations it's really very critical that you speak with that clarity and you know uh, in- ensure that you have the right set of value you, you accord the right value to what you say so much so that i've begun to believe the most evolved form of communication is proverb right and there is a reason i chose like i said to put a proverb to accompany my slide content um, this is not just a presentation style it's really something i hope you remember um, long after you forgotten everything else that i've said right you would be surprised to learn that there is a language called uh, rotoka's language spoken about by about 4500 people just 4500 people in an island called bogenvilla with just 12 sounds that's it 12 sounds i'm not kidding you you would wonder how would they communicate how would they express are we really complicating our lives by using this excessive language for example if you bought a gift home for someone you would say hey tohfa laya right but then uh, you know you bought a gift for somebody like your spouse or girlfriend or beloved right you would say tohfa 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 laya 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 just two words but you are expressing so much more so i i started to think maybe jitendra and sridevi had figured it out all right but jokes aside i mean in my mind besides the classical uh, scope schedule resource trifecta there are a few critical factors that drive the success or failure of any project and i would rate change management as amongst the top two right only after executive commitment innumerable times i've seen my juniors and seniors alike complain about a product or a ca- application or a capability or a feature that wasn't adopted by its intended beneficiary they would wonder why did we go to such a length to develop something that is not even being used right because they did not secure what my colleague aptly put it as emotional buy in from the customers and client now emotional commitment doesn't necessarily emotional commitment of course does not come when you are not connecting with the people right you're not connecting when you're not speaking their language right and when the language is used just for speaking but not communicating um when you connect very amusing events occur you can communicate with somebody uh, who doesn't know your language now i know i started with a remark on sharukh khan and i thought it would be only appropriate to end with one of his famous song um, so here you go
so moral of the story um if you even if you've forgotten everything right of what i've said over the last 30 or so minutes i hope uh please ensure that you sing and dance or do something that makes you happy uh, truly happy and i would say asante sana which means uh, thank you very much in swahili and once again i would like to thank professor kamath professor borde uh, for this opportunity to come and speak with you all i really hope you enjoyed the last 30 40 minutes of the discussion and and uh, you know i'm happy to answer any questions if you like dear participants if you have any questions kindly type it in the chat box or you can unmute your uh, audio and directly ask to the guest speaker but uh, teja i think before we do that uh, there is a thing which says that people were not able to hear the audio of the video if you could replay the video definitely one minute I think Sanjeev, that need to be uh, integrated. You have to. Yeah, it is integrated. Uh, let me let me try again. I'm going to actually bring the microphone a bit closer. I have an external mic here, so hopefully that works. You can see my screen, correct? Now, Sanjit, I think uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sanjit. Yes. Uh, there is a participant and a colleague of mine who says that Google Meet does not play the audio. Is that right? Because you come from Google. Ah, uh, no, I don't think so. That is. Not, yeah. Never heard that before. Okay. Yeah. Because we are still not able to hear the audio. Nobody is able to hear the audio. No. No. No, no, no. No, sir. Uh, usually, no, sir. Usually, when you do a presentation, you have to explicitly, particularly when you want to play videos, you have to explicitly go and set it up. I have done that on Zoom. I'm not sure about. Uh, okay. How about, um, how about now? Can you try? Or if not, I will just go directly to the drive and see if that works. Yeah. No. No. let me let me try just one more thing okay just give me one moment actually when i was not aware of this in fact you... sanjit there is a there is a request coming and i second that why don't you sing for us that song and show us <laughs> no some other time nilesh i think this is uh, this was really meant for somebody who doesn't understand our language no this is this is this is a managerial learning sanjit we are trying to do crisis management <laughs> i was actually singing the sharukh khan song so it was uh, it was the tum pass aaye from kuch kuch hota hai and uh, you know this this guide of ours was actually singing that song very very well so just give me one second i'll see if i can actually pull that up Oops. any luck now for some reason no sanjit sorry mm. well what i'll do is i will uh, send it across to you all okay participate it then perhaps you guys can play it at home i'm really disappointed that i couldn't play that because uh, it was very interesting that he was able to actually sing kuch kuch hota hai along with us and uh, you know 
like the jolly good fellow he was but like i was making a point around communicating and connecting i think when you actually do connect and communicate you don't don't really need to have that kind of language i think it just happens and and sometimes it is quite amusing so cool um yeah so that yeah. is it that is the core content of my talk in case of questions i'm very happy to you know take it now Yes, so Sanjeev, what are the perspectives that you take to your Google office uh, from this mountain climbing kind of passion? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think. So if you could probably, you know, probably narrate a few incidences where you you probably uh, brought in that passion of mountain climbing and used it in your in your daily supervisory life. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think this majority of what you saw today, right, was was really my lesson. I took, took back home. I mean, I think in over the last two years, like I said, um, you know, I've tried to, uh, you know, feel good about what I do. Um, you know, my passions lie somewhere else, but you know, oftentimes it feels a little cliche when you like work and do the same thing over and over. But I think if you just remind yourself that this is what you get to get, you know, uh, get to do, and not something that you have to do. And going back to the incident that I was like telling you, that hey, this is. Uh, this is something you can give your best to. I feel, you know, it makes a difference. And like I said, the people who you know, graduate out of school, oftentimes there is this sense of entitlement. Like I often meet people, right? Like a lot of people who I interview and people who are come out of it. So there's a lot of noise. Um, so people could mute it. I'd really appreciate that. Um, so there is, there are a lot of students who I meet, interns, there are, people who I actually um, interview, uh, they will, you know, oftentimes they'll come from good schools and you tell them what you want to do. They will say something like, um, um, you know, I want to do strategy, right? Um, and, and that's like one of the most popular words that you hear from the people because they believe that essentially um, uh, MBA has given them that right to simply jump onto doing strategy. And I feel like, uh, you know, it's a little too premature to start thinking about that. And it's more about, you know, um, you know, like I said, more about basically um, taking it slowly, right? Uh, getting your fundamentals right. And then surely if you have talent, you obviously are going to do much better than everybody else. Um, same thing with, like I said, communicating. I mean, change management is a huge deal. You know, when you basically um, uh, want things that you develop to be adopted by the users. It's so important and not just adopted by the users. I mean, if you want to even get your team aligned to do something, it's so much important to connect with them either at a personal level or, or some other fashion for them to sort of align with your own goals or change yourself to align with a larger goal, right? Those are the things that you have to do. And like I said, uh, one of the things that I always feel is I've started thinking uh, that you could be a son and yet be in the clouds. Right, so you don't really necessarily have to be that person who shines all over the world. So um, I would say those are those are some of the tidbits that 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 I try and sort of remind myself as I go through my my day one, you know, every day. Thank you. So Teja, there are questions that are coming in. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next question is from participant Manoj Arodhya. He wants to know that like when we climb on the mountains, we leave the people behind. Similarly, when we achieve heights in our career, uh, we leave our acquaintances behind. But this kind of a situation leads where people start making you feel jealous and the conversations are much complicated as compared to the previous times. He would like to know how to manage relations with friends and acquaintances in such a situation. Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I've not reached there on top, uh, but uh, I mean, I still am very connected with my friends and everybody around me. But I've heard this from people who have made it really big that, you know, uh, more higher you get, lonelier you feel. Um, you know, you, my directors have told me that, my senior directors, my vice presidents have told me that, that, you know, it, it really does become lonely when you get onto the top because people always view you as a VP or a view you as somebody other than uh, them as a person. I, I really don't have like a great answer for this, Manoj. Honestly speaking, what I feel is 
one needs to decide what is really important to them. I think success doesn't necessarily have to conflict with your relationships and friends. Uh, I think if you perceive to be friends uh, are jealous of you, then, you know, I wouldn't say just simply discard them, but maybe it is either a story that you perceive in your head or uh, it could be that you need to have different friends, right? Uh, of course, I wouldn't recommend just go look out for different friends every time you go up, you know, up a higher position. But then there's also this filtering process. I mean, what do you ignore? Um, you know, what is it? Where where do you find strength is, is the question. So in other words, you, you may have, um, somebody told me this, in fact, very recently, and I feel so, it's so, so right that, um, you know, even people you perceive as friends, sometimes they you you may feel like they're jealous of you, um, or they're not doing enough for you, or or they're not reciprocating enough for you. But then it's really important that you find what is the core strength of your relationship with them. Like what is the what's the good that basically makes you guys friends with each other, right? And if you feel like that core can stay tennis as you rise up, then you don't have to worry about somebody feeling bitter or somebody feeling jealous or somebody making a conversation behind your back and so on. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Gajesh Naik. He wanted to know how do you correlate pole, which is synonym to susegat? to working in a fast track google company yeah that's that's a great question like i said earlier when google is so fast paced that um, like you know somebody other day was telling me that you know hey we didn't have a kickoff for this project and this project is already midway and you know that's the pace at which sometimes things work at google um, but like i said it all depends on the individual sort of grabbing opportunities and pushing forth with it um, and I said, like I also gave an example, right? In pole pole to me, which is Susega, then by default, it's it's in my blood, so I cannot really do anything about it. I try to, I think it's, it's you need to understand that your pace is unique to you, right? Um, I think you don't need to really compete or compare or or just beat everybody and, and be ahead of everybody. Um, I think it's really about recognizing your strengths and your own limitations and 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 maintaining the pace that's optimal to you um and you know pole pole isn't like i said it doesn't mean that you sort of slow yourself down it's really a matter of ensuring that you're maintaining your your pace I and mean, i think particularly during hiking for example um you know pole pole doesn't necessarily mean that you just slow yourself down and take a break and all that it just means that you go at a very steady pace so that you can tackle um, the, the the larger problems as opposed to be uh, you know fascinated by something short term and then if you if you want to talk spirituality there's this concept of shreya and prayer um, I encourage you to read um, it comes from I think Katha Upanishada so if you get a chance please do read it. Thank you, sir. So the next question is by Professor Kamat. Uh, what is the challenge in managing people uh, who are smarter than you? Yeah, um, trust me. I mean, almost everybody who I uh, manage, I feel like they're smarter than me. Uh, they, they, uh, they are. Uh, how do I say this? I think. Um, there is this in Google, almost everybody who I've spoken to, right, goes through something called imposter syndrome. And you must have heard of it, Professor Kamat. The imposter syndrome is essentially, uh, you know, have you reached here by mistake? Um, you know, you talk, look around and see really smart people around you and talk really bright things. And you feel like, oh, my God, where have I really gotten myself into? Um, I think to me, what helps, I mean, it has helped is a little bit of communication. Um, I feel like giving respect to them um, helps um, having the empathy to understand them helps uh, so basically i do my best to connect to them at a at a at a uh, 
you know at a at a personal level and by personal level i don't necessarily mean that go out for a beer with them or or you know be friends with their family or anything but just find some common thread of connection that's one thing the other thing is um yeah i mean i think you i tend to give opportunities to people as much as possible as i can and i'm not really truly worried about them overtaking me i mean if honestly i feel like if there are there's at least one person who i feel like in my team who's got a you know who's who eventually will have a terrific trajectory um i'm not really truly worried about them going ahead of me and uh, you know um at some point if that needs to happen it may happen and you know so be it but i think what you can do is sort of take a back seat and just try and enable people as much as you can and i feel like you get that respect back from them too um when you do that thank you sir so the next question is from mr rajiv nadvikar he would like to know uh, would you take this same track again and if yes why and maybe if no why as well i would like to add yeah. to that um actually i you know we have talked about it um we've talked about going back to kilimanjaro um just to ch challenge ourselves one two uh to meet the same people i mean i would if i go i'll go back with the same people um we've come back and watched uh, documentaries in a very nostalgic manner uh, and sort of relive those moments so there is lot of reasons why we would go back we would go back to meet the people i would go back to challenge ourselves uh, and then sometimes when you are in you know nature particularly you know things places like kilimanjaro let me tell you something right so recently you must have seen the pictures from um, uh, the guy who shot the uh, the black panther and, uh, and and his cleopatra right the tigers uh, that was a very famous picture recently and he was talking about how he essentially spent 12 hours uh, for the shot there are photographers who spend years in the jungle to get shots there is a guy who's you know in yellowstone there is a national park here that uh you know that he he's been in national park for like last 20 years taking the picture of the same sunset right and you wonder why is he doing it because every day the sunset is different according to him so why would i do it i feel like if i just go back again it would be completely different experience maybe there's some something more to learn um so yeah uh, it would be fun besides africa is a beautiful place i feel like um i'll tell you another story actually um i hope i have we have time but um, you know in front of my house there is a there is a tree uh, it is called gorakchins right and i believe that that might be the only tree in whole of goa who knows i'm not sure but that's what we've heard ever since we were kids uh, and in english it's called baobab and it was really amazing when i went to africa that one of the places or national parks that had seen was full of baobab trees Right, full of baobab trees all all over the place. It's kind of funny that's called baobab, like how we say in Goa, baobab, tobab, dambab. So, um, the so so the point being, you know, it's like a experience. You you learn things like that. And by the way, I learned something very more very interesting about the gorakchins as well. Like apparently, if you take the seeds of the fruit and then put it in the uh, in the water, it makes a lovely brew, uh, like alcoholic brew. And all this while we were. living next to a source of alcohol and we didn't know it so so imagine being a goan how bad that is thank you sir uh, the next question is by mr nagesh kamat going through your hobby list how comfortable are you in us and do you miss goa and the friends back home Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I miss friends all the time. Uh, I miss Goa quite a bit, but every time I come, it's it's really amazing because you know I get to see everybody. Uh, I have really close friends, and some of them are here, my neighbors. Uh, it looks like he's also asking a question. We'll uh, see next. But he, uh, it's it's really great uh, uh, to see back people back home, and. as far as comfort in us is concerned i think uh, there are pros and cons living everywhere i don't think you should really think in terms of um, at least i don't try not to think about it as here i'm comfortable versus 
here I'm not uncomfortable. I think the goal is to make yourself comfortable everywhere you go. So um, I try to do that. But yeah, of course I miss friends. I mean, I think I've had the best of the times when I was growing up in school. Um, you know, just just the entire journey, even at Agnell Polytechnic, Goa University, there is government engineering college. We have had a great set of friends. I'm really happy to see some of them actually have joined. Um, so, you know, absolutely miss friends all the time. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So another question, uh, how would you relate uh, your journey or your climb to Kilimanjaro to your annual climb to a Chandrashikar, Chandreshwar Parvat at Kepe? <laughs> uh, besides the fact that one takes six hours and the other takes six days, um, I think they are both uh, meditative. They are very spiritual. Uh, they they make you feel like um, you know it, it does relax your mind uh, when you do both the climbs um, so since prasad has done a lot of chandreshwar parvat hikes i think i will invite him to come to kilimanjaro with me next time so would love to huh? would love to do the chandreshwar one sometime absolutely absolutely yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so there's a question by Samit Hegde Desai. What do you think it takes for mountain climbing? Um, well, okay. So basically, I think one, it takes an intent to begin with. You need to want to go there. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it takes a lot of preparation too, particularly if you're climbing uh, climbing a mountain like Kilimanjaro. Now, I want to be very careful. Like Kilimanjaro is not a technical climb. So in other words, you don't really need mountaineering skills like Ventish Kamat earlier sir, was talking about. Uh, this is really more like a walk, but it's a very arduous walk uh, and it's a very long walk. So it's not necessarily that you need skills and tools to actually climb it up. The other thing is you need to be ready to, I think, also fail because, like I said, at one point you have this issue with altitude where people feel sick and, you know, um, I've seen people being dizzy. In fact, even after being making it all the way to the top, there was this lady who actually just slumped in the ground because she couldn't deal with the, the altitude anymore, right? So there are, you know, people feel exhausted, people feel delirious, uh, people start hallucinating. So you you need to be able to fail as well. You need to be prepared to fail as well, saying that, okay, well, you could be among those 15% people and, and then have to face the world in an embarrassing manner, I guess. But but then uh, I think first intent, enough preparation. Um, and like I said, lots of uh, friends to to keep you going because I don't think you can do it alone. Like I, like I also said earlier in an African problem, which is one of my favorites, is uh, it's like, if you want to go somewhere quickly, you run. But if you really want to go far in a place like Limanjaro, which takes about six days, it's really important that you go together and hold hands with people who you know. Thank you, sir. Sanjit, I was, uh, Teja, if you could permit me. Yeah. So, Sanjit, I am quite intrigued about a few uh, reports that are coming in with. Uh, um, the Congress Inquiry Committee and the U.S., especially even Trump, trying to come with an iron hand on all the big uh, tech companies. Yeah. So I think there's a lot that is being done against Amazon. And they've also brought in Facebook and Google, which is your company which you're working in. But uh, more than Google specific kind of questions, what do you think, uh, what is your take as a, as a person who is technically in the area and also living in U.S.? What is what is exactly? Can you give us a little feel on what is this exactly a problem in US with respect to te the tech companies? I think uh, I can give you a very generic answer. I would not like to reference Google in this at all because uh, I respect Google. It's my employer and no, generic, generic, generic. Yeah. So I think the general concern uh, there are is is that uh, there are issues with privacy because almost everything that you uh, you know when you go online. Essentially, you're exposing yourself, right? And particularly when you use uh, uh, you know, things like Facebook or or um, Amazon, maybe have certain different issues in terms of its size and all that. Uh, but Facebook, Apple, 
uh, Google, where you know you are essentially you know handing over a certain amount of personal information to them, and therefore there's a lot of trust associated with that, right? Implicit trust associated with that. Now it's it's obviously very therefore very cons, you know natural that people uh, doubt tech companies to use that trust in a manner that would be advantageous to the companies. Um, you know, depending on again, there are two sides to this. There there'll be there'll be people who will say that yes, you are violating my trust, and there are people who say, you know, hey, this is completely fair that this is not happening. So I don't think it is really right for me to comment, given where I am, to 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 speak about what is right or wrong. Um, I think the but the but the concern comes from that, and that concern gets inflated. I would say um, this is when we have congressional hearings, and particularly parties, you know, like Democrats and um, and and Republicans, wanting to 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 sort of corner these people, like you said, right? The um, what was interesting that I thought was this, it is also a party angle to it. For example, uh, Republicans may be worried about Google or Facebook or other liberal companies, you know, sort of being the window for more liberal information, which is not true, I think. And then uh, the Democrats may in turn be, be bothered about something else, um, you know, uh, and I don't quite remember exactly what are they, they what they were, uh, concerned about but but that is really the gist of it um but like i said I, I i really don't want to get into like the specifics of it um you know in in this call thank you sanjeev thanks a lot yes Teja, over to you anilish so there's a last question do we have the time should i take the last question oh, i'm fine yes yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. So the last question is by Gajesh Naik. Uh, I am a fan of your devotional songs. Isn't isn't it you evoke Lord Damodar at the peak of mountain Kilimanjaro? I did actually. I was I was very thankful that I made it. In fact, uh, me and there was another person who went with me, Rakesh. Uh, we actually were you know literally in tears because it's it was a pretty exhausting journey, and then you know to be there, like I said. Uh, no matter how hard you try, uh, for the picture, you know, obviously you try to pose like Shah Rukh Khan, but internally you are like, uh, you know, you're trying to feel, oh God, I made it, now I have to just get back. So I did in Vokta Mother, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. I would like to request our student, Shalom Fernandez, to present the vote of thanks. Shalom. I think she might be having some audio issues, but it's 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 quite fine. I, I you know I'm very happy. Uh, I, I request Nile sir to give the concluding remarks. We are not able to get it. I think Sanjit is saying something. Yes, Sanjit, I'm sorry you were saying something. I was just saying that it's it's quite okay. I don't need a formal thanks. I'm really happy to be connecting to be to to so many Goan people uh, and students particularly, so I I should be the one who's thanking Professor Porte and Professor Kamat to have given me this opportunity to come here and actually address you all. So um, so thank you very much, Sanjit. In fact, it's, it's it's been a pleasure and a privilege hosting you as a as a part of Goa Business School. And let me tell you, we at Goa Business School believe in the fact that. Uh, there's a lot of managerial learning to take away from this perspective building. Whether you look at this perspective building like the way you have seen like mountain climbing or whether it is art or whether it is movies or music or painting and things like that. So, um, yes, yeah, so these perspectives are amazing and especially when you when you talk about bringing them in in managerial decision making, I think it, it just adds value. Uh, thank you so much, Sanjit, for your time. And I'm sure I think I can see the clock behind you. It's almost one o'clock there at night. Is that right? I, if, if my no. 
11:10. It's 11:10. Okay, sorry. I mean, I'm that I'm not off the mark. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> only the, the the size of the hand mattered here. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. thank you so much, Sanjay. Thanks a lot. It is oh, yeah. really a pleasure you. So you and, and having you. Thank you so much. And thank you yeah. all of uh, all the participants for uh, participating in Fomento Lecture Series. Thanks a lot. Thank good you. day. Yeah. Good day to all in India and good night, Sanjay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. यू मुस्कुराए यू मुस्कुराए तुमने न जाने क्या तुमने न जाने क्या सपने दिखाए सपने दिखाए अब तो मेरा दिल अब तो मेरा दिल जागे न सोता है जाने दा जाने दा सोता है क्या करूँ हाय क्या करूँ हाय कुछ कुछ होता है कुछ कुछ होता है <laughs> <laughs>